Okay. Craig, okay, we got it. Okay, I think it is, I think it is now recording. We'll, we'll give it a shot. It's going to be a cheap, not very very high quality recording, but we'll we'll give it a try. Okay, so we were uh, we were looking at uh, DNA replication, and according to my notes, anybody need that outline? There you go. Anybody want one of these? Um, I think we were we were right down. I thought maybe you did. Again, some of this is review of what we had been uh, looking at a little earlier. And I cannot, there we go. But we're we're going to kind of go through uh, review a, li a little bit of all of it. So I. I was telling you about the basic mechanism of, of uh, the way in which DNA replication occurs with the new nucleotide being added onto the three prime uh, hydroxyl of the primer as directed by the template strand. Uh, I do want to point out one thing for you down at the end of this outline. There's a little section called uh, nomenclature. And so if you zip all the way down here. Uh, you really, we're now in a 400 level course, you really should start calling these things what they're really called. And I'll be honest with you, geneticists get, and cell biologists get lazy and don't use the proper terms some of the time. But you really should know what the terms are. What I have for you here is a listing uh, of the names of the nitrogen bases. And then when you add the sugar onto the nitrogen base, you get a nucleoside the names of the nucleosides, and then when you add a phosphate, you get a nucleotide. So, for example, with RNA, well, we have, we have these four nitrogen bases. Here we are, the four nitrogen bases. Adenine, guanosine, cytosine, and in RNA, it's uracil. Of course, in DNA, it's thymine. When you add the sugar to that, it now becomes adenosine. So adenosine is the name of the sugar attached to, the, in other words, that'd be a ribose. That's the ribose attached to the adenine. That's adenosine. And guanine becomes guanosine. Cyto cytosine becomes cytidine. And uracil becomes uridine. When you then add a phosphate to it, now it's a nucleotide. And so you can call it adenylic acid, or guanylic acid, or cytidylic acid, or uridylic acid, or what we normally call it. We normally don't use these terms. We normally call it adenosine with one phosphate on it. So we call it adenosine monophosphate, AMP. And this becomes guanosine, that is guanine and its sugar, with one phosphate. So we call it GMP and CMP and UMP. Now, of course, if what's actually used to synthesize the DNA and the RNA is going to be the trinucleotides, not just one phosphate, but three phosphates. And so that would be what's used to synthesize RNA is adenosine with three phosphates. Adenosine is the name of the nucleoside, but this is actually the name of a nucleotide, right? Because this is uh, an adenosine with phosphate on it but it actually has three phosphates. So our old friend ATP, that's the energy molecule, is also the building block for use for RNAs. This is going to be the, the molecule that's used when we start putting in a, a residues when we're making an RNA molecule. So be aware of these. A, ATP is an adenosine with three phosphates on it. Uh, uh, AMP is adenosine with two, one phosphate on it. Of course, we have ADP in there, which would have two phosphates. Um, so these terms you should be familiar with, and for DNA, all we do is add a deoxy to the front of it. The one difference here, of course, is thymine, when, it, when you add its sugar to it, it becomes thymidine. And since it is the deoxy form, that is, it has deoxyribose, rather than ribose, we're going to call it deoxythymidine, deoxycytidine, and so forth. So the building blocks that we're going to use to make the DNA are the deoxynucleoside triphosphates. They are these nucleosides, these deoxynucleosides, with three phosphates on them. So they are DATP, DGTP, DCTP, and DTTP. Um, 
I suppose uh, this is not this is not that big a deal. But uh, when you when you're when you're uh, looking at a DNA molecule and you say, okay, what's that right there? Well, that's that's a that's the the base T. Well, that's not really the base T. This is the base T. That's the nitrogen base T. If you're circling that whole thing, I'm assuming you're circling the nucleotide, and so that's really an AMP. That's the nucleotide, and so. Uh, we, we need to start using the correct terminologies, but I am not going to be a real stickler for this, you know, if you, uh, and like I said, geneticists get lazy too, and we say a DNA molecule is made up of millions of base pairs. Well, it's more than just the base pairs, it's the nucleotide pairs. It's, the, it's not just a bunch of A's, T's, G's, and C's, it has the sugar phosphate backbone too. And so, uh, the people get lazy and, and just say adenine when they maybe really mean DAMP. They're really talking about the entire nucleotide. Uh, this is not such a big point that you're go I'm going to expect you to know this uh, for a whole bunch of points, but I am going to expect you to know it for one point, okay? <laughs> one point on one test. I will probably give you a question something like, Name, uh, I, I could give it as a multiple choice. Uh, which of these is a uh, nucleoside found in DNA? A nucleoside found in DNA. And if I had AMP, that'd be wrong, that's a nucleotide. It's not found in DNA anyhow, it's just AMP. If I had uh, Guanine, that'd be wrong, because that's not a nucleoside, that's just a nitrogen base. If I said uh, cytidine, that would be wrong. That is a nucleoside, but it's not a DNA nucleoside. But if I had deoxycytidine, then that would be the correct answer. So just so that you understand the, what the terminology is. Actually, the only, the only real new terminology, new words, is realizing that when you add the sugar, these change names from adenine to adenosine, from guanine to guanosine. And so you should be aware, at least aware, of these, uh, th this terminology uh, as we go through. But ain't, like I said, don't lose any sleep. Maybe I should tell you that. Don't lose any sleep over, over, over there. Sleep will be lost. Okay. So uh, Kornberg made his discoveries in the in the 50s, in the late 50s, got a Nobel Prize right away for his, his pioneering work. Uh, but uh, along about the same time, other studies began on, on, on DNA replication. And some of these studies were simply watching the DNA molecule replicate. And there was a series of studies, I didn't even give you the name here. There's a series of studies by, the, by a man by the name of Cairns. I suppose you should go to John Cairns' name. I believe he's British, if I remember right. Uh, Cairns did some early experiments trying to visualize DNA replication in E. coli. <laughs> and so what, what Cairns did was to take some E. coli cells. Now, an E. coli cell has a circular chromosome that's all coiled up here in the nucleus. And he got a way to kind of spread it out. So th this, is, this is an E. coli cell here. Well, he actually was able to spread these chromosomes out so that you could literally spread them out like on a microscopic slide. And you could actually get this in. They weren't quite that big, I don't suppose. But, but you could actually see the entire chromosome spread out on the slide. Now, DNA is not, the molecule DNA is not large enough, of course, to be seen with a regular microscope. Years later, a technique was developed to be able to see it with the electron microscope. But Cairns used the only way he could, he could to visualize the DNA at the time, which was autoradiography. That is, he labeled the DNA with a radioactive substance. And I don't, I have to go back and look and see if it was tritiated thymidine or probably something like that. But he, 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 ra he labeled the, the DNA with a radioactive substance. Once he got this DNA spread out on the slide, he, laid, he, had, he had originally, before he did that, he grew those cells in a radioactive medium, so this DNA is actually radioactive. And then, in the dark, lay a piece of film on top of it. 
and stick it in a drawer overnight and come back and develop the film. And what happens is the, the film lying right there on the, on the, the outline of the DNA, the film will be exposed and you'll actually be able to see the outline of the DNA molecules. So he did this with replicating DNA molecules and to simplify what he found, it's a little more complicated than this, what he, to simplify what he found, sometimes he found something like this, sometimes he found something like this, or maybe even he found something like this. What he never found was something like this. He never saw any, any molecules that looked like this. What Cairns interpreted this to mean was, here are DNA molecules in the process of replication. Um, and so the, the DNA being radioactive has kind of shown us an outline of that DNA. And so he interpreted this molecule to mean that this is actually a double-stranded DNA molecule. And the process of replication has started. This molecule comes all the way around as a circular molecule. But it has started here such that this much of the DNA molecule has already finished replication. And so replication is proceeding around this molecule. Now, uh, Karen's got two things wrong. He was right in assuming this. Uh, but let, me, let me just go ahead and show you what the others would be. Obviously, this one, this one would mean that DNA replication had, you know, had started a little earlier. And so that much of the DNA molecule was replicated. And this part over here was yet to replicate. This one right here would indicate that really the whole, the whole molecule, had almost, almost the whole molecule had replicated. We could have drawn that one like this, I guess. Kind of, kind of like that. But if you take this piece and flip it over here, then you have that. So that all of, all of this much DNA had replicated, and only this little piece right here in the middle had not yet replicated. From his conclusions, he, from, from his observations, he concluded that replication must begin at only one spot for every chromosome. The, the, the origin of replication is where replication begins. We now know it is a fixed spot on the E. coli chromosome. But Karen's concluded correctly that there is only one origin of replication for the E. coli chromosome. You start replicating the chromosome, and the entire chromosome starts or is replicated from that one start point. Um, what he did not realize, and we now know, is that that origin was probably right here in the middle, and replication starts and actually proceeds in both directions like this. Cairns envisioned that it had started over here, and so if this was the origin, you went all the way around until you got back, and back to the starting point. But actually, replication starts here and is going, uh, going in both directions, and so replication finishes over here on the other side of the chromosome. That is, we now know, Cairns told us this, Cairns did not tell us the other part, but we now know that DNA replication is bidirectional. It's bidirectional. Uh, it, it, it runs in, it goes both directions. We start from that origin, that point right there will be the origin, and we start replicating in both directions. In other words, we set up two replication forks. We're going to call that right there a replication fork. And if we look at that real close, this is kind of like what Watson and Crick were proposing. Here is the place where that old DNA molecule with its base pairs is the two strands are coming apart. And as the two strands come apart, we're putting in new nucleotides. Now we're going to run into a problem here, but we'll get to that problem a little bit later. So this right here is the replication fork. And you can think of the replication fork then as moving toward the right, whereas this one over here is moving toward the left. So there's our replication fork. So he kind of pioneered this concept of a replication fork 
and that there's a, he discovered there's only a single origin of replication for the E. coli chromosome. Uh, there's, a, there's a problem that we're going to pick up a little bit later too, which has to do with the fact that the DNA molecule is a helix. The fact that it's a helix means that if we're pulling these two apart, you're just twisting it tighter down, down the other end. And Cairns proposed a really neat idea that turned out to not quite be right. And so we'll put it here and mark it out. He said there is a swivel point in the DNA molecule. Somewhere in the molecule there's a swivel so that it can spin and spin and spin and spin and spin. In fact, he's got, I want to, I have a, sometimes I put quotes of the days up on my door uh, and uh, one of his quotes was, if this turns out to be right, we may have discovered what is the first example of a tiny molecular wheel. Well, it turned out to not be right. It's not exactly the way it happens. But it was, it was a neat idea. At least he recognized there's a problem. If you've got this DNA molecule that's all twisted around each other, and you're going to start pulling the two strands apart, and especially if you've got a circular DNA molecule, you're never going to be able to pull them apart. You're just winding it tighter on the other side. But we'll come back and take up that problem. So a few years later, I guess quite a few years later, some people have decided to do the same experiment with higher organisms' DNA, with Drosophila and then in mammalian DNA. And by that time, you could actually do electron micro microscopy. So, microscopy. So you didn't have to deal with radioactivity. You could take replicating chromosomes, spread them out, coat them with something, and look at them with a scanning electron microscope. And you could actually see the outline of the chromosome. Well, what, what happens when you do this same kind of an experiment with a eukaryote? Well, of course, the eukaryote has linear chromosomes, not, not circular chromosomes, but they're also much larger. And what you see in eukaryotes is multiple places where it looks like replication is going on. You see this sort of thing in a eukaryote. So we know that whereas in E. coli, there's a single origin of replication, in eukaryotes we know there are multiple origins. Not too surprising because there's a whole lot more DNA to replicate. And you take an awful long time if each chromosome had used only one origin to replicate it, it'd take a tremendous time to replicate that whole chromosome. So you start the replication from multiple spots and you have these little these, these little things eventually became known as replication bubbles. So you have multiple replication bubbles when you look at it, when you look at them uh, under the electron microscope, whereas in E. coli there was only one replication bubble, indicating that there are multiple origins in eukaryotic replication, but um, only a single origin in uh, prokaryotic replication. But just like in E. coli, you have bidirectional replication. That is, there's a replication fork here, and there's a replication fork here, and replication is going that direction and that direction. So starting that origin would have been in the middle. The origin would be the place where the strands first come apart, and one replication fork starts moving one way, and the other moves the other way. It's been estimated that in uh, mammals, uh, the replication origins are average. They, they vary quite a bit. But what does it say here? The main origins are spaced 50 to 300 kilobases apart. That's 50,000 to 300,000 bases apart. So the distance, the distance between here and here is some, somewhere between about 50,000 and 300,000. Um, there's an interesting experiment that was done. This one is not actually talked about in your book, but I remember being a graduate student and this experiment was done and thinking that was, that was a neat little experiment. There was an interesting experiment that was done uh, in which someone asked the question, how does a cell replicate fast sometimes and slow other times? In the same organism, you can have cell division happening very rapidly or it could have it happening very slowly. Like when the cell is, when fertilization first occurs, those first few divisions 
those are happening pretty quick. You get cell divisions in a matter of hours. Whereas normally in our cells, it's gonna take at least a day to go through one cell division for, for most dividing cells. Some things that are in a hurry may go quicker than that, but usually to go through one complete cell cycle, it's gonna be about 24 hours. So how is it that the same cell can replicate all of its DNA in a matter of an hour or maybe even minutes? Sometimes, but at other times, it's gonna take many, many hours to replicate. Why does, how is it that replication speeds up and slows down? Well, there's two basic concepts. One of them, one well, two basic possibilities. The replication fork can move fast or it can move slow. You know, you have the replication fork on steroids and it just, it's just zooming down here. It's really going fast. Or you have a replication fork that's moving very slow. The other possibility was when you're in a hurry, you activate all of the, the replication origins. If you're not in a hurry, you only activate some of them. Well, we know at least that the, the partial answer is, is, is the second one. I don't know if anyone has done a definitive study to say replication forks always travel at exactly the same rate or not. Maybe the other one is involved too. But we know that there are different numbers of replication origins activated. Because what they did was they took some Drosophila embryo cells. Uh, Drosophila embryo is one of the world records as far as fast division they go through all these nuclear divisions and don't even do cytokinesis at first. The first divisions, they just, the nucleus divides and it divides and it divides and it divides. And it goes through a whole cell cycle in about 15 minutes. So that's super fast. So the DNA replication time is just a little short part of that. So they took those cells and looked at their replicating chromosomes and compared them to other cells in Drosophila that are replicating, not its, not its uh, such a speed, and so let's say this is the embryonic ones, and the ones and the cells that uh, from another tissue, maybe they look like this. There were definitely fewer replication origins per length of chromosome in the slowly replicating chromosomes versus in the rapidly replicating chromosomes. So we know that at least one way cells speed up the process of replication is by simply activating every possible um, uh, replication origin. We can define a term also. We can define a term called the replicon. The replicon is the amount of DNA that's going to be replicated beginning with one origin. So up here, there was one origin. Replication is going to go to here. Here's another origin here. These two are going to meet somewhere in the middle. So from right here to right there, that would be one replicon. That's the amount of DNA that's going to be replicated beginning at that origin. And so this much, that's another replicon, and that's another replicon, and that's another replicon. So one thing that that experiment did was it showed that the size of the replicon is not constant. Sometimes you have little short replicons when you're in a hurry. Sometimes you have big replicons when you're not in a hurry. It also means that E. coli's chromosome is one replicon. The whole chromosome is a single replicon. Okay, so now I want us to take a look at the 19... Uh, I want to say 59, is that right? Don't have the date there. The, the classic experiment by Meselson and Stahl, uh, which we covered sort of briefly in uh, genetics. We'll cover it a little more detail here. Uh, the, the, this experiment that demonstrated that DNA replication really does happen like Watson and Crick said, the overall concept of what Watson and Crick said. You know, the Watson and Crick model of DNA replication, we could call it the semi-conservative model of replication. Because Watson and Crick said you've got a DNA molecule with some sequence. Those two strands are going to separate from each other, and each one is going to serve as a template for 
synthesizing the new strand. And so we synthesize, we start putting the new nucleotides together. However that happens, of course they didn't know about uh, DNA polymerase at the time, but however that happens, replication is going to happen like this, so that each of these molecules here is really half the old molecule and half the nascent or newly made molecule. Half of it is a newly made molecule, half of it is the old molecule. We have two identical DNA molecules, but for each one, half of it is the old molecule and half of it is a newly made molecule. In other words, the old DNA molecule is half saved in the new molecule. So this became known as the semi-conservative model of DNA replication. Well, Matt Meselson decided, I, I showed you Matt Meselson's little uh, video earlier when he came up with this methodology of cesium chloride centrifugation. But Matt Meselson decided to ask that question. What can we say about how DNA, re DNA replicates itself? What can we say about how it replicates itself? What are the possibilities? Well, here's one possibility. Semi-conservative replication. Let's just draw that very simply and say, here's our original DNA molecule. And when we're done, we get molecules that look like this. That's the semi-conservative model of replication. Well, what other possibilities are there? Well, maybe. DNA replication, instead of being semi-conservative, is conservative. Maybe somehow or another that you get a completely newly made molecule. The new, the new molecule is both strands are new made molecules, and the original molecule is just like it is, just like it was. So this model was the conservative. Not just half of it is saved, but the whole molecule is saved in, in the new DNA. That's the conservative model of DNA replication. It might be hard to explain how this happens, but you, you could come up with a hypothesis, and you could say the DNA molecule splits apart. We start synthesizing these new strands, but then the old DNA molecule, once you get them made, they go back together, and these two peel off and match each other. I mean, you, you could come up with a hypothesis for how this might happen. So that was another model. But in kind of racking their brains about, well, what other possibilities are there? Well, one possibility, and there's really kind of several variations on this model, maybe the DNA molecule doesn't remain intact. Maybe it gets kind of fragmented. And so we end up putting together, at the end of replication, some of the molecule and each one is newly made in some of its pre-existing DNA, but it's not, let's just it there, it's not one strand all new and one strand all old. So this model was the dispersive model. So in order to try to show how DNA replication occurs, they said, what we need to do is we need to put several models up here and see if we can uh, design the experiment that will eliminate some of those models or maybe agree with some of these models. So this is what they were working with. They did their famous experiment using uh, a label, this time not a radioactive label, but actually a density label. They started, they used um, <clears throat> ammonium chloride that uh, in which the um, in which the N was uh, N15, the ammonium was labeled with it actually had an extra neutron. Normal ammonium, excuse me, the nitrogen. The ni normal nitrogen has um, a molecular mass, a molecular weight of 14, seven neutrons and seven protons. This one, th this atom has an extra neutron. Now it doesn't. It's not actually radioactive. But it, is, it does have a greater density, obviously. That atom would have a greater weight per unit mass. And so they labeled E. coli. They grew E. coli in some, here's, here's a flask here with E. coli growing in it. But this medium has the N15 
ammonium chloride in it as the only nitrogen source. And they grew this for many, many generations. E. coli is really good at making everything it needs out of whatever bare minimum you gave it. And so since this was the only nitrogen source, all of its nitrogen, after growing this for several generations, all of its nitrogen becomes labeled with the N15 isotope of nitrogen. All its proteins have N15, and all the bases, all the DNA bases, wherever there's an N, it's an N15. So you can think of that these cells that are in here actually have, we'll call it heavy, it's really dense. They have heavy DNA. Their DNA has uh, all the nitrogens are the, the uh, N15 nitrogen. So in their experiment, um, uh, Meselson and Stahl used this methodology of cesium chloride centrifugation. And if you're, again, if you remember what that involved, we take cesium chloride, uh, a, a solution of cesium chloride, and centrifuge it at very high G forces, and you establish a gradient where the heavy cesiums, atoms, uh, ions, will collect at the bottom of the tube, and you actually have a gradient of cesium chloride concentration in this tube, which is also a density gradient. Since there's a higher concentration of cesium chloride, the bottom of the tube, the bottom of the tube is actually denser. And if you get the right concentration and the right g-forces, you can get a density gradient such that DNA's density falls somewhere in the middle. So they put the DNA in the tube, and they found that if they put their N15 DNA, that is, they take some of these cells, isolate the DNA from it after they've been growing for many generations, and uh, isolate the DNA from those cells, put that DNA in this test tube, they find that that DNA ends up at a specific band that matches its density. If they had done this same experiment with E. coli cells that did not have that label, that were N14, so we'll, we'll, we'll say here's the, the N15 DNA. If they had done that same experiment with cells that, uh, just normal E. coli cells, and isolated its DNA growing in regular uh, growth medium, they would find that that DNA gathered at a band a little bit higher because it has a lesser density. Let's make it even higher than that for illustration purposes. We'll put a band right up here. So this is where the N14 nitrogen DNA get. So those are kind of their two standards. They knew where the N14 DNA would be and where the N15 DNA would be. Okay, here's their experiment. They took some of these cells that were growing in N15 medium. Their, uniform, their DNA should be like this. They took some of those live cells and transferred just the cells into new growth medium. It's now in 14. Any idea how you do that? You've got a flask full of cells, and you want to get the cells out, not the medium, just the cells out, and move them into another flask. How would you do that? Centrifuge, get a pellet. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they centrifuge. They, they, they take a sample, take some of these out, they centrifuge the cells, all the cells go to the bottom, suck off the supernate and throw it away, and then dump those cells into the N15 medium. So they transferred those live cells into the N14 medium, and then let them grow for certain periods of time. At the very beginning, they should look like this, because the cells were all N15 labeled. But after the equivalent of one generation, that is, at the point when the cells had doubled, and you, you can measure this, you can see, you know, when, when you had concentration of cells, now that concentration has doubled. That means every cell is divided. And so that's the one generation point. At the one generation point, they, took, they, they again took out some of those cells, and isolated their DNA and did this same experiment. So after one generation, 
what they found was that the density of those cells was right in between these two. This DNA in the cells that had grown for one generation in the light medium, they were completely uniformly labeled with, with heavy uh, in, in 15, and now they had grown for one generation in 14 medium, those cells had a density that was halfway between the heavy and the light. That result, that, that result is completely consistent with this model. If we're starting off with N15 DNA, that means that both strands have N15 in all their nitrogen bases. After replicating the DNA, all the new nucleotides are going to be using what's available in the medium, which is in 14 synthesized uh, nucleotides. So this strand will be completely light, and this strand will be completely heavy, but the DNA in general then should have a density that's halfway between the light and the heavy. Now they went to, they, they, they let this experiment continue they left these, remember, they took some of the cells out at one generation, but they let these cells keep growing, and they took some of the, they let, then took some of the cells out at two generations. At the end of the second generation, if they isolated some of these cells, and then extracted the DNA from that, from those cells, and did the same cesium chloride centrifugation, for two generations, what they found was, now they got a band at the hybrid density and a band at the light density. Which again is exactly what you expect. If this is what's going on and we go on and we replicate one more time, then that molecule is gonna give rise to one like that and one like that. And this molecule is gonna give rise to one like that and one like that. Another, whoops, not like that. The new DNA is light. So we're going to get half of our molecules of the hybrid density, half of the molecules completely light, if red means completely light. And that's exactly what they got. Their results through this second generation were completely consistent with semi conservative replication and completely inconsistent with conservative replication. What would you have seen if conservative replication? have been driven. At the first generation, what we have seen right here? Yeah. You'd have had a heavy band and a light band. You'd have gotten a heavy band and a light band. The clincher, the real, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm confused. Go ahead. So with the, um, the 14 unit, that's the light band, right? Yes. And the 15 is the heavy band. Right. So you're saying with the conservative model, if, if conservative replication were correct, then that means, see, this is heavy, then our after replication, we should have one molecule that was completely heavy and one molecule that was completely light. We should have never seen that middle density one. We would have never seen this, this band right here. Instead of that one band, we'd have gotten one here and one here. The clincher, of their experiment was they took some of this DNA after the first generation and heated it. What happens when you heat DNA? Hybridizes. The two, uh, it, it, it denatures. Not, not here. It denatures, like you said. It denatures. The two strands come apart. So the two strands come apart and then they did the experiment. So if you take this DNA and you heat it to 100 degrees or something like that. And then you do the experiment again, now you get a heavy band and a light band. You get, a, you get a band here and here. In other words, showing all the heavy label is in one strand and all the light label is in the other strand. That pretty much rules out this model too. All the heavy strand DNA is in one strand, all the light DNA is in the other strand. So, so this experiment, this really elegant experiment uh, is, is one 
that not only pioneered this new methodology called cesium chloride centrifugation, but it answered a central question of cell biology. Does DNA replication really happen like Watson and Crick said? Do the two strands come apart and each strand serves as the template for synthesizing a completely brand new strand? And that experiment said, yes, that's exactly what happens. So I will usually ask you a discussion question on this you know, to be able to explain uh, this experiment. And I really want you to be able to uh, explain the, the experiment to really describe what they did. It's in your textbook, so you can read through that if you want to. There was another experiment. This was in E. coli. There was another experiment that came a few years later. I can't remember my dates now. I want to say early 60s, maybe. Have to look that up. But uh, Taylor Woods and Hughes were dealing um, with the plant, with the, with the bean plant, and they did a similar experiment. Uh, this time using, again, autoradiography, using, using a radioactive um, uh, material instead of density labels. And the, the results were a little bit, um, you, have to, you have to think through the process a little bit to really see what would happen. Uh, they had DNA that was, you see, I was having my label DNA is white, so I'll keep my strands the same. They had DNA that was labeled with uh, tritiated thymidine, that is, uh, the, the, the thymines were labeled with a radioactive label. And so, again, they grew, they grew some plants with this tritiated thymidine. For several, it actually had the roots growing in this medium, and so the roots of cell division were occurring. They, were they had an overabundance of this label, so the, the cells took that up and they incorporated that into their DNA. So they had uh, cells where the roots, the, the DNA was labeled with this radioactive label. And then they switched those roots, they just pull those plants up and put them in new water, new growth water that had normal thymidine. So the, the, these are no longer radioactive. And so they did the same kind of experiment. After one generation, what should happen? After two generations, what should happen? Well, what they were looking at was the chromosomes. And so at the, at the beginning point, when you look at the chromosome, when you look at a chromosome, that chromosome is already replicated, right? That's the only time you can see a chromosome is after it's replicated. So you can think of this chromosome here. Let me make a great big chromosome. You can think of this chromosome as having two DNA molecules that are completely labeled with the radioactive label, okay? There they are, they're completely labeled with the radioactive label. Now we're gonna switch these cells into a medium without the radioactive label. So all the new DNA now should be the other color. It should be the unlabeled. Well, what's gonna happen? Well, if you, one generation is going to mean that this chromatid right here is going to give rise to both chromatids of the next chromosome, right? This DNA molecule is going to give rise to both of those. So what we should have is radioactive DNA in this strand and in this strand, and non-radioactive DNA in this strand and in this strand. And then if you go another generation, now, this chromatid is going to give rise to both chromatids of the next generation. And so you should have one chromatid that came from that one, and all the new DNA is what that, that was that was the label. I'm doing this the wrong way. I'm assuming the white is the label and the red is the unlabeled. So this you should get one of these that has a labeled strand and an unlabeled strand, but the other one, the one that came from this, should have two unlabeled strands. Now, how do you, how do you measure that? Well, what they did was they took, they took a slide and had all these chromosomes on it, and they had a picture of the, of the chromosomes, but then they had film that laid right over the top of it so that they could lay this film on top of the, the normal picture of the, of the chromosomes 
and you could actually see the outline of the chromosomes and see where the radioactivity was. And the radioactivity shows up as speckles on the chromosomes. So over here, these chromosomes were just uniformly speckled. There was radioactivity in both chromatids. And so they had these little speckles in both chromatids. Well, after one generation, this is the one generation mark, we should have chromosomes, again, where both chromatids are labeled, but not as much as these. Unfortunately, this is not a very quantitative method. It's hard to tell. Are there more speckles there than here? It's really hard to tell. And so all they could tell at this point was there were speckles in both chromatids. You know, it wasn't quantitative enough to say there's twice as many here as here. But they did have radioactive label in both chromatids, as would be predicted. But after the second generation, sure enough, one of the chromatids was labeled and the other one was not. So again, that was consistent with semi-conservative replication. That's what you would expect with semi-conservative replication. Now, to be completely honest, it wasn't quite that simple. They ended up seeing what we now know to be uh, sister chromatid exchange. Chromosomes can undergo a mutational event where this end of this chromosome right here pops over here and this one comes over here. They swap arms, they swap pieces of chromosomes. This is not crossing over because this is the two identical chromatids. Uh, and they saw a lot of that probably because they were using, they were growing these cells in very high radioactive environments. And so they, when you look at their data, they had to really talk around it. They had to say, you know, their data was not nice and clean cut. All of our chromosomes over here have no label in one strand and label in the other strand. What they really saw, some of their, many of their chromosomes would look like this. It, it would look something like that. And they had to say, uh, you know, I think this really does show semi-conservative replication, but we're getting an abnormal event of, of, of a mutational event of sister chromatid exchange from all this high radioactivity we're using. So it, 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 everybody kind of accepted that. I mean, it, wasn't, it wasn't maybe quite as clean an experiment as Meselson and Stahl's experiment, but uh, everybody accepted that and said, okay, then uh, there is this exception, but this strange thing going on. But, but in fact, we'll assume DNA replication is, in fact, semi-conservative in eukaryotes, too. Okay, so now let's, let's take up that problem, that one of those problems we've been putting off. Uh, we covered this in genetics, but we want to cover it in a little more detail here. One of those major problems, semi-conservative replication is true, but Kornberg really messed things up for us when he discovered DNA polymerase. I guess it's his fault. It's DNA polymerase's fault. DNA polymerase only works in one direction. And so the nice, simple concept of a simple replication fork with replication just kind of trucking along, it's not going to work. We've got to, we've got to come up with some other idea. Remember, we have, let's, ha let's look at some replication fork here. Here's, here's a replication fork. And I'm not even going to put the bases in here, but here is here is our template strand. We'll say we'll say this one has its five prime end here and its three prime end here, meaning the other one runs in the opposite direction. And we have replication that has begun. So here here we are at our replication for it. Where replication is proceeding in this direction. <coughs> well, what Kornberg discovered is there's no problem on this side. This strand is growing in the five prime to three prime direction. We have a three prime hydroxyl group right there that we can add a new nucleotide onto and therefore extend our primer and we can just keep adding nucleotides, no problem on this strand. 
over here is the problem. This strand, however it got there, <laughs> is running in the wrong direction. It's anti-parallel. It has a phi prime end here, and what we want to do is start adding new nucleotides here, but DNA polymerase will not add nucleotides onto the phi prime end. So what is going to happen? How are we going to get around this problem? I like to tell you guys a story that is not on the test, but it is, it, it's one of those neat stories that, tells, that, that shows that just because somebody has what seems like a breakthrough idea that's going to solve everything, logically, you think of this idea and you think, wow, that's got to be it. It doesn't necessarily mean it's true. There was a um, meeting of um, Cold Springs Harbor. There, there's, there's a real famous set of meetings that still happened in, in I think it's upper New York, uh, Cold Spring Harbor. There's a, there's a research lab. And people are invited to go to those meetings. I've never gotten an invitation to go to those meetings. This is like the top scientists of the world. And they'll have these invited conferences. And so someone, you know, nowadays it would be studying epigenetics or some new cancer research or genomics. And the top in the field are invited to come for a week and they're paid. And they, this, they present their research and they discuss. And apparently it's just a really, it's a really fantastic time. Well, there was one of these meetings in the 70s when this whole problem was, was being discussed. And someone made a presentation and in the discussion that followed, Somebody came up with a solution for this problem right here. Now, normally in the proceedings of, Co of uh, Cold Spring Harbor, they only have the papers themselves. Well, for if you, if, I, I, I meant to go back and look this up, but if you look up this particular session, they have the discussion in there too, because this concept came out of the discussion time. Someone said, you know what? What if, this, and this kind of just arose as they were discussing it, what if DNA polymerase, working five prime to three prime, comes up to here and it turns the corner and goes like that? Now it has synthesized this strand it, it, with this little piece in the middle and it's going five prime to three prime over here. And then all we have to do is just cut that right there and then open it up a little more and we can do the whole thing all over again. So you know, now we've got that piece, and then we come up here and we turn the corner again. And it was such an exciting idea at this meeting that I imagine the people that left that meeting had thought, we've solved the problem. We've got it solved. We now know how DNA replication occurs. And this became known, you can look this up if you want to, as fork, this is DNA replication fork, the fork and knife. The fork and knife moss. <laughs> The fork and knife. You need a knife. You need, a, you need an endonuclease. All you need is the, you need this fork and you need this, you go, go around the corner and then this endonuclease comes and cuts it and you do some more. And you can replicate the whole chromosome like that. Well, the cell, unfortunately, the cell didn't think of that. This is not the way it happens. It was a fantastic, wonderful description that would have gotten us around that problem, but it, it, it doesn't work. Anyhow. Now, that's one of those things you'll not get from anybody else's cell molecules. You get that from the way you I, I think I remembered some of these things because I was a graduate student when all these, uh, some of these things were being done. And I think that was one of them. And uh, I, but by the time I heard about it, it had already been disproven, I think. So if it's not the fork and knife model, what happens? Well, a, a Japanese scientist by the name of Okazaki I always told my Japanese friends, yes, a Japanese scientist discovered this, but he was working in the U.S. when he made this. But anyway, Okazaki, by the way, if you want to know, can I still do this? Okazaki. There you go. There, that'll be on the test. <laughs> you can use my name if you want to. <laughs> Okazaki. But this part's easy. Fragmento. Okazaki discovered Okazaki fragments. Okazaki fragmento. Okazaki discovered that 
DNA replication over on this strand is bonus. Whereas over here, it's continuous. That is, DNA replication on this strand is good. But over here, DNA replication occurs in little spurts in this direction. So you go 5 prime to 3 prime there, and then you jump up here.